Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's History and Theory of Technology series. Today's event is presented with generous co-sponsorship from the Department of Rhetoric and Media Studies. My name is Hannah Zeven, and I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University in the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering, and a former executive committee member at the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. Our History and Theory of New Media lecture series promotes new interdisciplinary approaches to questions about the uses, meanings, causes, and effects, of rapid or dramatic shifts in techno infrastructure, information management, and forms of mediated expression. BCNM commits to supporting indigenous sovereignty. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Hu Chin, uh, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, specifically the confederated villages of Lijan. The history of prophylic technological development in this region, as in every region, has always depended on the land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place here today on and in relation to this land. We invite everyone to participate by responding to tonight's lecture in the chat or in the Q&A portion and ask that attendees help us maintain an inclusive, respectful and harassment free space. Attendees who violate any of these guidelines will be removed from the event and may be disallowed from future online events. If you're new to any of our events, please feel free to read through our community agreements and we'll be sharing a link to those in the chat right now. Today, I'm so honored to introduce uh, Kelly Moore who is our speaker today. Kelly Moore is an associate professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University. In her debut book of scholarship, Legal Spectatorship, which is just out this past year from Duke University Press, Dr. Moore traces the political origins of the concept of domestic violence through visual culture in the United States, tracing its appearance in Article 4 of the Constitution, slave narratives, police notation, cybernetic theories of affect, criminal trials, and the look of the battered woman, Moore contends that domestic violence refers to more than violence between intimate partners. It denotates the mechanisms of racial hierarchy and oppression that undergird Republican government in the United States. Drawing on Harriet Jacobs' incidents in the life of a slave girl, abolitionist print culture, courtroom witness testimony and the work of Hortense Spillers and Frantz Fanon, Moore shows how the logic of slavery and anti-Black racism also dictates the silencing techniques of the contemporary domestic violence courtroom. By uh, positioning testimony on, domestic, on contemporary domestic violence prosecution within this archive of slavery, Moore demonstrates that domestic violence and its image are haunted by Black bodies, Black flesh, and by Black freedom. Thank you so much, and please join me in welcoming Professor Kelly Moore. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, thank you very, very much for your very kind invitation and the introduction um, to, to this talk. Um, I should say in advance that I, for some reason, will not be able to advance my own slides. So it, every once in a while, I'm just going to say slide and a new slide will appear. Um, so this morning, this, this evening for me, I'm going to take the opportunity to expand a line of thinking from my first monograph, Legal Spectatorship, Slavery, and Visual Culture of Domestic Violence. This is a, I'm really grateful this, for this opportunity because I realize uh, that I'm able to point, um, make a point or two um, as a way of suggesting how the book and its claims ought to be read and the problematic in which it intervenes. So I'll offer a provocation about those claims and future uh, research uh, in this talk. And so in addition to examining some of the material from the book at the beginning, 
I'll also present some work that's forthcoming in a special issue of First Monday on visual evidence. And the object for me this evening is to lean into some of the claims of the book even further to explore with you how the book is positioned within the cybernetic hypothesis, and in particular, um, that the title of that book by Takun Collective, and to emphasize the ways the cybernetic, the cybernetic hypothesis was, from its beginning, elaborated around the dispossessed lives in a central position. I'll take up the cybernetic hypothesis principally described in the work of Takun's cybernetic hypothesis, uh, I think originally published in uh, 2001 and in translation in 2020. As my title suggests, I offer a discussion of a minor cybernetic hypothesis. Its discussion um, is rather appreciative. This discussion is rather appreciative of Takun's text, but it is one in which that, that I must diverge and, uh, diverge and disidentify with on some elements of it to pose a different set of questions about the distinction between freedom and autonomy. I'll slide. I'll begin with the oh, slide again. I'll begin um, as I do in the book with a representation of the memoir of Harriet Jacobs. Um, this is Ellen Driscoll uh, on, on the right. Ellen Driscoll's uh, sculptural interpretation of what Jacobs referred to as a loophole of retreat, her loophole of retreat, which was the garret space that she hid inside of um, for seven years as an, as an act of black feminist refusal, um, refusal um, to, to be, um, to remain in the household uh, with her captors. Um, so this is an artwork that was made in uh, between 1990-91, and criticism of this artwork took issue with the rationalization of Jacob's Garrett hideaway, rejecting the reduction of Jacob's experience to a kind of ready-made. But Driscoll's attempt at authentic, albeit whimsical, representation of the Garrett was precisely what interested me. Driscoll's sculpture would of course fall short of capturing the terror, debilitating emotional and physical pain of hiding in a garret for seven years with little but a hole to look its outside of. But for me, its ordered rationalization spoke to the way testimony must proceed in courtrooms. Jacob's memoir also testified to the ways emancipation uh, enabled former slaves to testify to experience, a rhetorical position previously unavailable to them in law. Slaves were silent witnesses of white plantation life, and in particular, the dissolution of white domestic arrangements. Slaves were enveloped in a communication pattern of white marital breakdown and the spousal abuse it typically entailed. And I rely rather heavily on this point on the work of, um, um, uh, Stephanie Jones Rogers and her really amazing and, and important book, They Were Her Property. However, slaves could not testify to household events even as they were used as conduits of communication between quarreling husbands and wives. Today, the adjudication of domestic violence is mediated by a variety of instruments and techniques. The silent witness is not only a novel technology prior um, to such as the X-ray or photograph, Overcoming its fungible condition is part of a larger possibility and, and problematic of emancipation post-Civil War. Prior to the novel technologies of, um, of exam that, examine the, that are examined in the history of, of science, the silent witness was a person whose emancipation from New World slavery transformed the ability to testify to experience. So for me, the work in the, in the history of science on the X-ray, the photograph, Contemporary analysis of rape kits also, for example, really the Oedipus, the Oedipus, interesting important slip, really the Oedipus um, of criminal forensics must pass through the archive of New World slavery. An opening claim of the book is that knowledge of the silent witness transformed not only through the vague notion of the long uh, 19th century or technologies um, in the era of Edison, but with the emancipation of slaves. And this is a transformation that forces us to reconsider what the silent witness can mean to law, but equally to the history of science. The silent witness 
as a subject of legal emancipation, um, but, but one that would remain a slave in many ways, um, in many ways that cybernetics helps us to think about if we push it. In addition to the silent witness, in the book I refer numerous times to the slave's condition as also being unable to leave and yet unable to remain. This turn of phrase allows for a unified description of the slave and victim of domestic violence, and its unity captured the cybernetic framing and solutions that I examine today. Next slide. In my study, the most advanced knowledge of domestic violence derived from the cybernetics epistemic principle of intensification of tension and pressure, progressing and resetting through violent intimacy. Disciplinary advancement occurred precisely because the experiences of slaves and what we today understand to, um, to be victims of domestic abuse um, um, were unified. Knowledge of and policy action to prevent domestic violence dramatically increased once it was made an object of cybernetic and information and informatic fatigue. That's right, and technique. During the years of 1968 through the 1980s, social scientists applied cybernetic thinking to explain the incursions against agency, consent, autonomy, and freedom in these cases. This move was crucial because it gave us a language to think through the absence, of, the, the absence of reporting and leaving bad situations. I show in the book how the cybernetic hypothesis helped give rise to experts in the, in the domestic violence courtroom that helped prosecutors and juries talk through the visual evidence and witnesses um, as they testify to their experience. The hypothesis animates the domestic violence courtroom and its politics. But of course, lest we be too sanguine about the emancipation of the voice through the complaint of the silent witness and images of domestic violence that I examine, Takun in their 2012 uh, publication, Preliminary Materials for a Theory of the Young Girl, clarify that within neoliberalism, slaves can only um, uh, emancipate as slaves. And here, the slave that they're talking about is this young girl that they theorize who's a product of marketing and a fully, um, a full participation um, in capitalist accumulation. They theorize the young girl here as the emancipated subject, and like I said, full participation in neoliberal so social dynamics. She too is only emancipated as a slave, and Takun uses the word slave throughout that text. Where the collective does not use this word, um, as far as I can see, is in the, their earlier text, the Cybernetic Hypothesis. This text stridently disdains the very cybernetic thinking I've been thinking, I've been using. A cybernetic framing of domestic violence seems a smart way to conceive of power and control in these relations that are um, represented here in these power and control wheels. Um, it set the state and, act, and, it, and activists into motion on the issue of domestic violence. However, the authors of the cybernetic hypothesis give us pause, especially for those of, us, of those of us working at the threshold of philosophy of science and technology, black studies, legal theory, and media studies. For the hypothesis characterizes both neoliberal framing of the problem and activist solutions. The authors reject this. For Takun, cyberneticists ignore the closed system they create in which the very framing of problems and the design of solutions is locked. Slide. Um, their book is also, also happens to be enclosed in Fortress Europe, the cybernetic network of pioneering white scientists working on the world historical problems in computing and energy transformation. The cast of characters and their fateful meetings is by now familiar. John Van Neumann uh, meets Norbert Wiener, who is building fast machines that would inform the Manhattan Project. Here I am uh, trotting out images of the Macy Conference uh, attendees. Uh, advance the next slide. Claude Shannon, Jeffrey Bateson, et cetera. 
Under the direction of Robert Oppenheimer, computers and atomic bombs are born together and so on. Though focused on the decade leading up to the years of 1968, as they call them, the writers of the cybernetic hypothesis hardly admire the achievements of these men. They are against this brand of thinking, these grand framers of problems and finders of even grander solutions are the cyberneticians. They are the quote, killers of time, crusaders of the same, the lovers of fatality, end quote. And to their credit, to Kuhn's argument, Eurocentric in spatial political scope and temporality focused on the years of 1968, don't assume that they've captured all of the cybernetic hypotheticals. And so in this talk, I examine a few texts that will help us outline perhaps a minor cybernetic hypothesis. Next slide. I'll turn first to a particular peculiar but influential piece of writing by Charles Babbage, one of the fathers of computing due to his work on calculating machines that will encompass elements of cybernetic thought. That text is the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise published in 1837 three years after the abolishment of slavery in England, which we know um, was really just sort of reformed um, through other means, through compensating slave owners, the disposition of African and Afro-Caribbean immigrants, et cetera. In the ninth chapter called On the Permanent Impression of Our Words and Actions on the Globe We Inhabit, Babbage offers some confirmation of the resonance of slavery in the contemporary its many afterlives in repeating bodies. A certain Captain Hayes reported the following horrors on a slave ship to his admiralty, his admiralty, events that were previously reported to him by an unknown representative. He writes, the men are chained in pairs and as proof they are intended so to remain to the end of the voyage, their fetters are not locked, but riveted by the blacksmith. And as deaths are frequently occurring, lining men of all of air still floating over the unpeopled earth, and it will record the cruel mandate of the tyrant. Interrogate every wave which breaks unimpeded on 10,000 desolate shores, and it will give evidence of the last gurgle of the waters, which closed over the head of his, are often for a length of time confined to dead bodies. The living man cannot be released until the blacksmith has performed the operation of cutting the clench of the rivet with his chisel. And I have now an officer on board Dryad who on examining one of these slave vessels found not only living men chained to dead bodies, but the latter in a putrid state. And we have now a case reported here, which if true is too horrible and disgusting to be described. When the ink was scarcely dry on the paper on which the remarks in the text suggested by a former description of the atrocities of the slave trade was written, the following paragraph caught my attention. Quote, slave trade, his majesty's ship, ship Thalia 31, Captain R. Watchhope has captured on the coast of Africa two slave vessels. One, the Felicite, six, uh, 611 slaves, the other, a Dahlia with 409 slaves. It appears the latter vessel has been chased by the, by the boats of one of our cruisers and to avoid um, being, come up, being come up with, she threw overboard upwards of 150 of the poor wretches, wretches who were on board besides almost all her heavy stores. Now, prior to this um, passage is another passage um, that, I, that I don't have time to read here. But in that passage, um, Babbage is having a hard time um, comprehending, comprehending why the ship's master um, doesn't understand why the slaves, when given the chance to get some uh, fresh air on the deck, immediately threw themselves overboard. So he just doesn't understand why the master of the ship is confused by this. Slide. Oh, this is a, just another uh, a form of a, one of uh, Babbage's own version of cybernetic loops, um, which is, happens to be a sort of 
preoccupation of cyberneticists. Um, they enjoy, it, it's part of their visual culture is to make these loops similar to um, the cycle in the wheel um, that I showed earlier in the slide. Okay, sunk in the depths of the treatise, a scientific paper that draws from Babbage's own theoretical work on calculating machines to suggest the coexistence of scientific law and God's design in nature is a report of a report of a report. Babbage in writing in, in, uh, is writing in response to the eight Bridgewater treatises. And it's worth noting, um, it, what's, what's worth noting is the fact that it's understood that there are only eight Bridgewater treatises, that they were officially funded by the Earl of Bridgewater, Francis Henry Egerton. In this sense, the ninth Bridgewater treatise, treatise Babbage's, is the treatise, which is not one. The peculiar status of the treatise is born not only of its unofficial relation to the other eight treatises, the problem Babbage frames, the atrocity he describes, seems to be different from the kind of rationalized solutions Babbage proposes as he reports in 1864 at age 73 about a variety of street nuisances recently described by Seth Franklin in the digitally dispossessed. In the treatise, the report of the filth and putrefaction of living slaves chained to dead ones regularly tossed from ships to defraud, to defraud insurers may be read at an, as an abolitionist complaint of the horrors of slavery. But it may equally be read as an example of the economic um, waste entailed in new world slave in this new world slave trade and the way the trade reformed or sorry informed the reorganization and re-racialization of labor during the industrial revolution including the very engines of calculation Babbage theorized and Franklin deftly examines thus the dead and the living are chained together and so too is Babbage Babbage's complaint in the spatial and social uh, conditions of production now my point here isn't to apologize for Babbage who was in his prime when he wrote the treatise and a crotchety elder um, when he was writing the complaints or reporting the complaints of street nuisance. Whether the writing is early or late, um, Babbage may be wholly, these two Babbages um, may be wholly compatible. Rather, it's to show uh, my argument here is that his early conceptions of the social as digital occurred around the slave atrocity report, which is an instance of a report amplification amidst the minor affects that I'll describe so shortly. So what did the treatise document as a report as bearing witness to domestic violence? Like so many of the cyberneticists framing of problems and solutions, we find in Babbage, Bateson, Wiener, Sylvan Tompkins, Martin Seligman, Lenore Walker, those last three I mentioned, I discuss in my book. Um, like so many of, of their framings of problems on and about how the structure of the world and knowledge work is yet another mention of the master-slave dynamic and the discovery of the Negro problem. How to reconcile the fact that the authors of the cybernetic hypothesis pay little to no attention to the Negro question at the center of cybernetic thought. And regarding Babbage's treatise, I mean conceptually and literally central. Babbage is nearly half um, finished with the treatise at the point where he makes this, um, where he recounts this long passage that I just read. How to reconcile the failure to attend to the Negro question at the conceptual, conceptual center of the image of the feedback loop that preoccupies cyberneticism. Babbage, who published four years prior to Harriet Jacobs' escape from the Flints in her resulting testimonial report, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, um, uh, sorry, um, is really sort of conjuring some of the very arguments that she's making in that text, but for himself. Babbage's treatise blends theories of the elements the calculation machine with observations of the horrors of the slave ship, their testimonial nature, 
the ability of even the atmosphere we breathe to remember violence is, highly, is a highly suggestive theory of the silent witness. It is one that accords with the experiment with allegation escrow platform services to respond to campus rape and sexual misconduct, to which I now turn. Um, slide. And so here is just a few quotes of what Babbage says uh, in that ninth chapter. Slide again. Here is the footnote that I was reading to you. And what I'm quite interested in is that um, in the passage, Babbitt, you can see, um, has an asterisk here, and that asterisk becomes the larger footnote of what I, of what I just read. And you're not able to, um, uh, archival collections don't represent this asterisk and the footnote that accompanies it in the same way. So sometimes you'll be able to see it, and other times you, you, you might miss it entirely. Next. Next, so these were um, separate points that I was talking about. So before I, I start talking about um, allegation escrow technologies, let's just put a pin in the fact that what we have here is the location of the silent witness in the archive of slavery. The very influential social scientists using cybernetics to frame violent um, intimacy of domestic abuse, um, which was so important in the, in, the, in the sense that it gave people including victims of voice to talk about how that relation worked. To Kuhn's strident critique, strident critique of the cybernetic hypothesis, a hypothesis with a visual culture, um, obsessed with cybernetic calculations and loops of different sorts. And Babbage raising the Negro question in the moment he is describing a calculating engine um, in his larger uh, elaboration of the compatibility of the respective truths of pure mathematics, natural law, natural religion and revelation. Okay. So one of the silent witnesses and, um, and forms of reporting amplification I've been writing about recently is allegation escrow, which I think is a demonstrable example of the conflict between Tikkun's writing about cybernetic thinking, which includes Babbage, and what it might suggest about new ways to collectively respond to sexual misconduct and violence. In other words, the need for a minor cybernetic hypothesis. In the Me Too context, the problem of proving um, accusations of sexual harassment, misconduct, and violence has led private actors to develop new means of reporting sexual assault um, that advance new sexual uh, social dynamics of victim reporting. At several US colleges, electronically encrypted applications called allegation escrows provide algorithmic fixes that introduce a matching paradigm into sexual assault complaint strategies. Allegation escrow services are platforms that allow users to log timestamped reports about sexual assault and, and misconduct that are released to officials only when there is a match among the reporters to the same offender. These tools transform sexual assault and harassment from he said, she said, to he said, they said. Alice Anastasia Powell and a number of other scholars have argued that, quote, social media blogs and other online communications are increasingly mediating informal um, justice for rape, end quote. Informal justice advances, sorry, addresses gaps in victim-centered legal responses, including through the circulation of anti-rape technologies, such as digital applications offering design features that send alerts, monitor users, and initiate evasive, evasive action for potential victim survivors. Research on these tools shows no correlated difference, or sorry, decrease in sexual violence with their use and implicates anti-rape apps in perpetuating myths, actually perpetuating myths of victim vulnerability and helplessness. Still, the technologies are notable for their potential to intervene in dominant evidence-based legal frameworks through popularizing the use of informal monitoring and reporting. The informal justice rape movement 
has also spurred more social science research on sexual assault on campuses. Research on the Title IX complaints is turning inward, with some US scholars and administrators studying and identifying target rape as a mode of sexual, sexual violence prevalent in institutions. This mode of perpetrating sexual violence on pre-chosen victims reflects forms of popular misogyny on college campuses with implications for factory floors, prisons, and other institutions. As it is part of the growing informal rape justice movement, the concept of target rape also informs the design of victim-centered digital applications to respond to evidence-based assault complaints in a world dominated by the logic of he said, she said. Last slide. Callisto, a sexual assault reporting application, models the promise of he said, she said, in which collected complaints shift the balance of power from alleged offenders to victims and from legal epistemologies to popular knowledge-making practices. Callisto, a, form of, um, a platform created by sexual health innovators, innovations in 2015, operates on an escrow model where users can informally report sexual assault and misconduct. The platform's mediation of the affective and cognitive responses of sexual assault reflects recent discoveries about the spatialization of sexual violence on college campuses that differs from knowledge gleaned from visual evidence of domestic abuse. Callisto's popular and informal uh, role in mediating the transition from he said, she said to he said, they said is enacted algorithmically reporting a deeper and more radical awareness of the spatialization of violence because of how the platform links victim, individual victims to the same offender. As offenders and their victims are localized to the same college setting, the campus identifies spatialized and racialized forms of reproductive violence in a way that the expression, he said, she said, heretofore left unmarked. Callisto reflects the mode and impact of reproductive violence which is structural and systematically occurring in institutional spaces of work and learning. The technology becomes a tool for users to decide whether to identify as a victim of sexual assault. Self-identification as a victim also comes with an algorithmically mediated chance to show responsibility toward other victims who could be out there. Here too, informal rape justice strategies are at the forefront targeting bystanders bystanders of sexual assault as agents who bear responsibility in an effort to increase informal and situated responses to stop sexual violence. Slide. So Callisto is one of, of a few um, different technologies here, and I could say a little bit about the others, but I, I mainly just engage with it with Callisto here. Slide. So um, and I should say also that these are the other technologies um, are not merely in the US, they're, they're global. Ian Ayers and Ankovic uh, describe information escrow apparatuses in the following way. Information escrows allow people to transmit sensitive information to a trusted intermediary, an escrow agent, who only forwards the information under pre-specified conditions. For example, an allegation escrow for sexual harassment might allow a victim to place a private complaint into escrow with instructions that that complaint be logged with the proper authorities only if the escrow agent receives at least one additional allegation against the same individual. Many kinds of information escrow models exist. Allegation, whistleblowing, suspicion, and so on. These can all be forms of allegation escrow. This examination considers the particular example of sexual assault reporting. A distinctive feature of sexual assault allegation escrows is how narratives of trauma inform the database structure, partly because victim activists, allies, and entrepreneurs have worked together to pioneer these design initiatives. Allegation escrows serve well the spatialized violence of sexual assault on campus. They produce popular forms of digital evidence and expand legal evidentiary traces consisting of photos, social media comments, texts, email correspondence, and videos. 
Callisto produces traces of the evolving mode of target rape perpetration and, te and technological options for victims who may find it difficult to quote, make visible cases of sexual violence that would otherwise have remained hidden or distrusted, end quote. And that's a quote um, from Alexa Dodge, um, who, who writes about um, sexual assault and the kinds of techno technologies um, that are used by activists um, um, to deal with, with the problem. The platform's matching feature requires the offender's Facebook URL as a unique identifier. Matching is a primary element of the Callisto reporting app, as is the record form feature. Um, and I suggest the potential expansion and amplification of popular evidence and recontextualization of the civil contract established between victims um, can occur or occurs through this technology. The problem with this, of course, is that the idea of a contractual life is precisely the thing that the authors of the cybernetic hypothesis are against, right? So all that I've been describing so far is something that, um, that they're quite disdainful of in their, in their original text. Yet according to historian Sarah Haley, who draws on Catherine McKittrick's method of considering specificity of place in accounts of reproductive violence, slavery's racial capitalism, quote, must haunt our analysis, structure, saturate our political imagination, end quote, about how to resist the history of gender, gender violence in the US and the Americas. To this end, the application features that intervene in the temporality of victim reporting must be contextualized referring to victims' rights as a movement that historically mobilized Anglo-American legal frameworks and media in ways that sidestepped prior fugitive responses to reproductive violence committed in, against the enslaved and ostensibly free black and indigenous women. As Haley reminds us, quote, the nexus of carceral capitalism, domesticity and reproduction has continued to mark the terrain of racial captivity, economic development and ungendering. Her study of black women in the Southern convict, convict leasing system in the 1890s attended to the prisoner uniform bloodied from the whip, forced labor and sexual slavery endured in camps. For Haley, rags cemented with blood and other bodily fluids are the missing evidence of racial engendered subjection that testifies to quote, the elusive hapticality of gendered carceral violence, end quote. The space of violence shapes what evidence can be. Uh, um, slide. Okay, so reporter's dilemma, which is explained you know, very briefly here, is what informs target rape. Uh, next slide. Where target rape um, is not the product of misunderstanding between situated students, but rather a pattern behavior that is premeditated, intentional, and often repeated. The theory tempers the criticism of Title IX by implicating social media, where males, quote, ally together in sexual pursuit of females, not only regardless of the female sexual desire, but often in deliberate violation of it. The idea is at once informed um, uh, for, for Callisto, sorry. The idea is at once informed by the target rape theory. Colleges may use, quote, the number and character of all male exclusive spaces, such as fraternities, social clubs, and athletic teams, male social capital and social currency, party themes, and, and control of social spaces as indicators of the level of male dominance on campus. As a mode of gendered violence, target rape supports the need for alternative possibilities of monitoring dominant male conduct and social dynamics of the campus environment. Through a general accounting of male dominance on campus, target rape theory has already been informing the dynamics, um, is that, sorry, has already been informing the dynamics of male status on college campuses, encompassing factors that administrators use to manage the prevention, response, and resolution of the feedback loops proliferating Title IX complaints. While target rape offers a picture of how assault happens um, to build prevention strategies. Gerson and Sook 
suggest research on, on campus assault is grounded in a much larger bureaucratic sex creep, end quote, that seeks to regulate not only sexual violence and harassment, but sex itself. In addition to these fears, part of their critique draws attention to the complementary rather than oppositional relationship between regulation and racial discrimination. They pointedly ask, quote, is there good reason to think that the unconscious racial stereotyping that may affect police and citizens in decisions to suspect, accuse, arrest, or shoot black men would have no analog in the pattern of campus of accusations and discipline for sexual misconduct, end quote. Gerson and Sook's concerns are supported by the absence of an analysis of the racial data on target rape. Target rape is theorized as a colorblind mode of sexual assault. That forms of criticism could be matched by misogyny is helpful for testing the idea that Callisto's reporting application mediates informal feminist planning that counters the popular misogyny at work in target rape. Callisto does not just match survivors to one another, it matches the form of misogyny at play in target rape. Through matching target rape, Callisto promotes a shifting evidentiary pattern paradigm from legal to popular evidence and the form of logic of he said, she said to he said, they said. Target rape expands the performativity and theatricality of reproductive gender violence on college campus settings where popular misogyny pervades. But how does this history of racialized reproductive violence inform popular feminism and misogyny? And here I'm thinking of the work of Sarah Benet Wright Weiser, who talks about empowerment feminism and how that is matched by new forms of misogyny. What do the record form and matching features of Callisto reveal about popular evidence of sexual misconduct and violence? The app frames assault as a matter open to a multitude of responses from the survivor and frames the experience as one that remains in process, one in which the survivor is in control. Callisto tells survivors that they are believed and supported, that, that as they consider what to do next, they have options. Um, slide. By mediating survivors' acquisition of legitimacy, agency, and crucially, the time to come into possession of these political elements, the platform demonstrates that engaging in the minor affects, what CNN develops as ugly feelings, is critically productive for manifesting evidence of campus assault and possibly uncovering target rape. Survivors may, uh, may voluntarily enter the site through their desktop, provided their university has made Callisto available and enter unique identifying details of, of an offender or perpetrator. Entering the offender's details is a search query whereby the app's matching feature can be enacted. They can download a record form, explore resources for therapy, see recommendations for recording violence and learn about their legal rights. A link to, to, a, to, to download a record form stages the platform's intervention into the temporality of the reporter's effective dilemma. Not ready to enter matching, it says, you can document what happened as you decide what to do next. Matching cannot occur without first filling out a record form. By emphasizing non-readiness as an option, the app routes users to an alternative activity to engage. So if you're not ready for matching, you can document as you decide. Users might never submit a match query, but they may engage in the rest of the thing. They engage the record form feature as a kind of therapeutic play that builds interpretive agency. Like a game, the feature explains its laws and risks of engagement. It opens to an eight page questionnaire that includes information about who can see the document, what to write, and how to save the file. The record form tool mediates an activity nexus between popular evidence collection, therapeutic play, and the creation of a larger survivor empowerment ecosystem. Though users can mark and make time to cope with the many facets of reporters' effective dilemma, 
Record form and matching are separate operations that the platform anticipates bringing together to transform the discourse of sexual assault. Rather than simply a personal escrow tool, Calesto is, quote, the coordinated ensemble of services, advisory boards, social networks, programming code, counselors, that ex quote, end quote, that expands victims' rights by transforming evidence. Reporting what happened is phrased to suggest the user might never submit a match query. You document as you decide. In combining answer checkboxes with space to write testimonial narrative, the record form feature mediates an activity whose duration the user controls. Users can take as long as they need with the form as they reconsider an experience in which control was removed. Thus, the form's temporality is, se is separate from a matching event, yet crucial to its enactment of he said, they said. In terms of racialization of sexual misconduct, the questionnaire asks users to recall anything about the offender, leaving communication about race and class up to the user. As the form avoids mentioning the offender's race, this omission could be interpreted as inheriting the color blindness modeled in target rape theory. As Souk once again points out, the dynamics of racially disproportionate impact um, affect, sorry, the, the, the dynamics of racially, dis, racially disproportionate impact affect minority men in the patterns of campus sexual misconduct accusations, which schools conveniently do not track. End quote. Coupled with Callisto's We Believe You Credo, the platform may aggravate and hide the racialization of campus social life, which, according to Sook, makes patterns of racialized assault difficult to study and expose. Callisto may thus contribute to the underappreciation of the disproportionate impact sexual assault accusations against male students um, from underrepresented racial groups. The platform may also rehearse the complications that Kimberly Crenshaw identified among black and brown female survivors. In the context of popular evidence making, the form shifts the identification of the offender's race onto the user, aggravating and hiding the inscription of race into popular evidence of campus sexual assault, as Sook warns. The disproportionate effect of race on sexual misconduct accusations suggests taking an ambivalent, if not wary posture toward the significance of the positive match. To be sure, working through the reporter's dilemma may offer no satisfactions of virtue, and I'm quoting Sian Nai here, may offer no satisfaction of virtue, however oblique, nor any therapy or purifying release. For, victim for victimization has, quote, a remarkable capacity for duration, end quote across the history of US reproductive violence. Interacting with the record form and matching offers no guarantee of a cathartic experience for the user. For, the user. for example, Callisto states, a match means that more than one person entered the same perpetrator's unique identifiers. If we find a match, that does not guarantee that a perpetrator is a repeat offender only that two or more people have identified the same perpetrators in Callisto, converse, in, in Callisto. Conversely, if we, quote, if we don't find a match, that does not guarantee that the perpetrator hasn't victimized other people. It only means that other people have not identified the same perpetrator in Callisto's matching system, end quote. Callisto that may thus conform to what Nye explained as non-pathartic aesthetics, that quote, produce and foreground a failure of emotional release, another form of suspended action, and does not and does so as a kind of politics. Both the report form and matching features may reassert the reporter's lack of catharsis, even as the platform invests in and supports ideals of reporting activity as a substantive evidence leading to better investigation and outcomes for survivors. Upon matching, Callisto authorizes legal options, a legal options counselor to mediate anonymous communications between matched survivors wanting to discuss um, further coordinated action. Legal options counselors are not administrative experts who, uh, 
merely reinforce lawyers' indispensability by advising and managing reporting and possible legal activity among matched strangers. Rather, counselors emerge as part of a holistic response to reporters' dilemma. What the platform cannot guarantee in terms of reporters' dilemma, even after a match, it does provide in terms of social movement building contra the logic of he said, she said, and popular misogyny, and the popular misogyny of targeting. Callisto's operating model upon college, um, sorry, their model operating model relies upon college and university engagement. Whether a school offers Callisto um, appears primarily to be a student driven work of campus associations that reach out to the organization. For instance, a case study on the site discusses how Syracuse University's student association collaborated with Callisto. I tried to enter the site by typing the EDU, uh, my university, an email address, and was given um, a screen informing that matching is not yet available on my campus. While my university does not have access to Callisto as of this morning, um, the option to allow my email address to be retained and used as targeting data um, uh, for its marketing is there. For now, however, the operating model seems less about possibly selling access to its escrow service and more about fostering institutional networks through student-led organization. Importantly, this means the platform's potential is modeled on student organizing. Students may collaborate with Callisto on a variety of ways that recall past histories of victim struggles to report violence, but Callisto must be invited first. At an organizational level, the platform models the kind of consensual interaction debased by target rape on campus. Through the collaboration of student organizations working to bring Callisto to campus, the paradig paradigmatic logic of he said, she said transforms to he said, they said. And here I'll conclude. My point hasn't been to ask about what Tikkun would think or even Babbage or the other cybernetic thinkers discussed here. Rather, it's to say that we are not, we're, we're not out of this paradigm. We've yet to be um, autonomous from this thinking. This is why Jacoon comes out so fiercely against it. Allegation escrow platforms are positioned within the theory of the silent witness and its situatedness in the archive of slavery. But equally so, they are part of populist, popularizing evidentiary forms. It is equally an example of cybernetic problem framing and design solution and the Negro question gets raised again and again throughout its design. So um, could you advance to the last slide? So I guess the provocation, this is a, a model of how, um, of how the match occurs. To continue? You can just go all the way to the final slide. Okay, so how I might, one, one, thing is that, one thing I might discuss in the Q&A is how we might see allegation escrow pack platforms as the experiments with all of their um, collective populist popularizing of complaint mediated by platform entrepreneurs and lawyers as an experiment with autonomy. And the reason I, I raise this question is that Takun ends the cybernetic hypothesis with this encouragement toward experiments with autonomy. And I think what I'm suggesting here um, in, this, in this work that comes after my book is that these collectivized forms of organizing um, might be a, a way of thinking about autonomy in, a, in an unexpected way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that brilliant, brilliant uh, contribution and extension of your book. Um, I want to first plug again the book that the link has already be, been dropped in the chat, Legal Spectatorship, Slavery and the Visual Culture of Domestic Violence, which is also currently 50% off on Duke's infamous 50% off sale. So please, please go pick it up. Um, Kelly, I'm wondering if we can stick with your provocation for another moment there as a way of extending out the, the back end of the talk. Um, which is to say that you end by saying that to Kuhn at the end of their book, and it's so interesting, right? The I was sort of thinking about their collective, both named and unnamed, and how that rhymes with what's happening in the escrow and that kind of platformization, which 
I haven't ever linked these two things together at all, despite my familiarity with your work. I think it's such a brilliant moment there at the end. So let me ask a question, um, which is to say, what is an experiment with autonomy in the collective and that kind of tension between autonomy and collective for Tikkun, and also in your case that you're bringing up with Callisto. And then also a second question would be like, why autonomy? Like, why is that the value rather than other values that might seemingly rhyme or resonate with questions of autonomy, such as freedom, uh, which is not the same. They're not coincidental. And you and I have just been speaking about this last week when we were together. And if if that might be the two places we could start with. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually hadn't realized that, you know, it hadn't occurred to me that Tikkun too is a collective here um, and, and kind of the argument that I'm making. And I think that's, I'm really glad that you pointed that out. Um, I think one of the ways they experiment um, is just through their really brash and frank way of writing and, and way of framing their understanding of the problem, um, particularly the theory of the young girl book, um, for example, was rather controversial um, in its reception. I mean, a lot of people were, were rather disgusted at what they thought as the misogyny of that book. Um, in it, if you're not familiar, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, they are theorizing this concept of the young girl who they say is genderless, um, but is this, you know, as I said earlier, full participant in capitalist consumption. She, she or he are part of the wellness industry. They are, um, they're exercisers, they're careerists, they're, they're buying and shopping, they're doing all those things. They really are a product. They are the, the self that emerges through, um, through, through consumption and through full acceptance of that. Um, I think one of their experiments, or, or maybe something that tells me that they're experimenting with it is that at the, at the outset of that book, they call it trash theory, right? And they're, they're pretty open about the fact that they um, that they read their own, you know, writing on this particular topic that way. I think another experiment is that, um, you know, the the brashness with which they um, complain that one of the problems with the young girl is that they offer, you know, some of the worst, you know, lazy, boring sex imaginable, right? And so they're they're experimenting with what this means, what this self, what this subjectivity means for sex, but they are less concerned about sexual violence in the ways that get worked out or that it, you know, get attempted to be worked out through allegation escrow technology. So I think that's you know, one way of thinking about their collective experiment. Um, as far as the autonomy um, thing, I think you know as I as I move through this um, this new project, so much of Black studies the, the research I did for the book, on and even the allegation escrow stuff, and thinking about you know Babbage and and Tukum Collective, etc. Um, I really began to notice that in Black studies. Um, the word freedom is, is used overwhelmingly more than the word autonomy. Um, I think I counted like in Fred Moten's book, Black and Blur, like he uses, he uses the word autonomy, but he uses freedom like three times more than the word autonomy. And I think that the, the distinction between those two words deserves um, for, further reflection. Um, we can imagine Robin Kelly's, you know, freedom dreams, freedom struggles, freedom drives. It's freedom. It's not autonomy struggles and autonomy drives and autonomy, you know, in that it's not, that's not the word that's used. And autonomy really um, in its, de its definition includes a form of self-governance that the word freedom in its definition doesn't really entail. Freedom seems to entail more, um, a moral state or position of being liberated. Um, that definition for freedom often includes um, 
reference to slavery, being free from slavery is also often included in, in the definition of what freedom is. Um, and so as Takun begins to imagine um, how to respond, or in fact, what they think is the inevitable response to the cybernetic hypothesis, I am quite interested in why they move to autonomy and not something like freedom and, and, and how Black studies and, and the Negro question might intervene there. Thank you so much. Um, before I keep going and monopolize our brilliant speaker visiting with us, I just again, want to say if you want to use the Q&A box, you can also use the chat. Um, I'm able to look at it now. If you want to ask uh, Professor more questions about this talk or about the overarching book project uh, that is now out and available from Duke University Press at 50% off, please join in the conversation. Um, it is my duty to plug this, this beautiful book. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us while folks gather their questions about how this latest case, the Callisto case, comes out of the book for those who haven't yet had a chance to read it. And the book, which centers on a sort of different set of archives of the present towards the end. And if you might want to just give a kind of, I always find it fascinating as a scholar in, in to hear about that shift out of that first project that you're with for so long, but yet you know, going to write and rewrite and rewrite again in other ways, um, which is another conversation I've loved having with you. So if you might just share with, with the audience. Sure. Um, so in that book, I'm really uh, investigating um, ethnographically, archivally, um, how we came to use um, photographs of battered women in, uh, I know it's overwhelmingly women, that's why I keep saying women is posing them, women as the victim, but it's, I mean, obviously it's queer couples, it's, it's all sorts of couples from all sorts of places. Um, but I was really investigating those images and how they worked and how they didn't work. Um, and I think one of the arguments, the key argument that I make is that women who are um, involved in these matters that the image is really used um, to contract with the court, to contract with um, violence against women legislation. And, and the way that you do that is through having this photograph taken of your injuries, your visible injuries. And now the, the circumstances under which those photographs are taken are somewhat nebulous. And there are a number of legal laporias um, surrounding how that image gets taken. And I, and I talk about that um, at the end of the book um, using a variety of theorists of contract, um, Charles Mills on the racial contract, Ariella Azoulay on the civil contract of photography. Um, and it just got me thinking in the case of Callisto um, that what we have here is another way of thinking about contracting within an investigation into, into the experience of that violence, not through a photograph, but through, um, through this platform. So it just seemed like the next step, which is precisely, you know, I think one of the reasons why um, I think the anti-cybernetics folks would be, you know, are so suspicious of it, right? And I'm just trying to grapple with that. And I think it's such a it's such a interesting case that way because again how it must and this is a, this is a question like shift that idea of contract theory from the example of the court documentation the silent witness the the degraded image uh, or various kinds of images that appear in your book and then this sort of status of contract that comes about with Callisto wherein it's multi-directional in this really interesting way like I'm, I'm very um in, and we have a question so I'll wrap mine up but interested in this idea of right like you can't elect as an individual to join Callisto right there's a kind of limit but it's not also disseminated as a, at a federal level like the title nine work that's happening at the same moment as Callisto emerges so thinking about how this kind of digital escrow shifts 
the contract because it's being carried across all of these levels. I'm wondering if you might speak to that as a real difference too between what or 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 outgrowth of what you saw in the court system from the you were going to finish your Just sentence at the end. Oh, sorry. At the end. Um, yeah, I haven't. I think the way that I've been thinking about it mostly is the difference, you know, between the 19th century and 20th century. One of the differences is this is the space of it, um, and the ways in which, um, I mean, particularly Diane Rosen Rosenthal's work on tar target rape. Like she really has, she went through all of these failed campus cases where young women had, had come to counselors and had, you know, just been so, you know, devastated by the kind of help, you know, that they received or rather didn't receive. And she really opens up um, the spatial and social dynamics of how this happens, which is um, similar in many ways to um, Hannah Rosen's uh, work that she had done about how black women had to move around spaces during emancipation and the ways in which um, white men uh, from, from the, the class that still understood itself to be the master class would feel comfortable walking into their homes and, and, and assaulting them um, in front of their families. Um, so those kinds of spatial dynamics have switched to college campuses where through you know, things like target rape and the kinds of new, new forms or new um, reinvigorations of misogyny um, that Sarah Benet Weiser is talking about, those things have, have changed somewhat, but the, the question of, of, of organized, men organizing in certain spaces, um, that I think has changed. I think what's also changed is the willingness for activists and, and theorists to understand the victims of that kind of spatialized violence as laborers, right? As, as, as organizing in spaces of learning and work and seeing the university as that. And then beginning to think more about the claim to violence as a kind of, as a labor claim. Um, and I think, I think that's one of the, uh, one of the major changes. That's so, oh, that's so fascinating. That's so fascinating. And I, I may ask you to return there, but we have a, a question from the audience, which I'll go ahead and read out. It picks up also on this sort of question of how things move from 19th to 20th century. So Diana asks, and for says, great talk, thank you. The question is, I'm wondering what are the most marked similarities in narrative models regarding the killing and or abusing of women in, for example, the 19th and early 20th century newspapers and the now? Are certain themes or student, certain wounds, for example, or certain visual criteria repeated most concretely, most strikingly, vividly across or then, so similarities is the, is the question, but uh yeah um that's a, a a fascinating question and thank you for asking it um I, I think my preliminary answer is that in order to answer your question it would require that we really delve deep into the kinds of um film and entertainment that we watch of women being abused in this way um, I make a point in the book to talk about the ways in which photographs of battered women um, that are, are sort of strangely advertised um, through faked um, replications or simulations of, of um, battered women's wounds. The law controls those faked images, but also directs real, you know, authentic visual evidence of domestic violence. And I think when we imagine you know, 20th and 20th, 21st century, um, the equivalent, we would have to include you know, the plethora of, of horror film and lifetime television for women and all of that, um, all of that stuff that so many people enjoy uh, watching um, in 
sort of training us to just to, to, to imagine what those images are. I think a lot of what we um, what we see is in dialogue with that with the, with that genre of film um, in a way that wasn't there in the, in the same way in, in the nineteenth century. So I would I would suggest that the theatricality of it has changed. That the history of uh, the way that the theater is in, in, involved, the theater of the courtroom, and also the, the theater that you watch at home um, or online, or you stream. Um, I think in order to research that question, you really have to, to put those two genres, the authentic images and investigations and the kinds of entertainment that, that is really popular on those issues. Thank you so much. That was a great question. And yeah. for others- It also involves the, the kinds of recording mechanisms too, right? Yeah, I mean, even contained in the question, there's there's that. So, you know, I really like how you're starting to unfold this. There's the authentic and then the re representation that are there in their own feedback loop yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, and so and think- Creators engaging in their own media making of, you know, what they've done is, is part of it too. And, you know, there are cases in the in the book where that slide is happening between the sort of courtroom and the spectacular beyond the courtroom. I don't know if you want to speak to that kind of where there's, you know, the Berlant idea, the genre flail of, of what exactly how we might name the kind of scientific, you know, instrumentation, which you talk about beautifully, and, and then this kind of other work that's being done on the victim. Yeah, I mean, I I spend a long time in one of the chapters unpacking how one of the most important cases that I'd seen um, while watching domestic violence trials, how it failed. And it failed because a victim was testifying on the stand to what happened and her attorney had a ton of images of her wounds and showed all of them. And she got disoriented and lost um, in terms of her own body on the stand and what she was identifying as the wounds. And she lost her case because the jury could perceive that she lost control of herself seeing the images of her own body. Um, so in, in a certain way, you know, that that is you know, that does refer to that spectacular moment in that case where you have to authenticate that these, that these images are you. Um, and this, I mean, part of what I'm getting at with the cybernetic hypothesis, a minor one anyway, is that um, that kind of experience of authentication is, is and is not the same as the kind of authentication that a variety of computing functions have to do, right? It's, it's not through a code, it is through a live body on the stand, but authentication is what has to happen in order for, um, uh, in order for the action or the activity of identifying the self to proceed. And at, at great kind of, not just cost in terms of losing a case, but also it's like the very conditions of having to authenticate in that example, make it impossible. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it contains its own undoing in the doing. Right. But then you enter the allegation escrow technology, which is the report of the report of the report, the application of the report, the collectivization of those testimonies. And oddly enough, a form of, of victim autonomy might appear there. And so I'm really trying to think of, you know, think through that idea and see if there's any, if it can make sense. <laughs> it makes sense to me, but maybe not to others. Yes, yes. And Diana just adds uh, that Diana is working on this question mm -hmm. and thinking about the scandal tabloids that emerge at this time along, alongside McGrackey, uh, Reagan. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But and again, I, you know, to, to go back to what I was saying about this kind of um, entertainment, there are so many like um, true crime podcasts um, where stories are told, you know, gruesome, you know, stories of women being murdered are told. 
There are um, conferences where many women, often white women, attend these conferences that are true crime conferences where um, there are all sorts of odd displays and opportunities to pretend um, to be a victim. And I think that's, I think that's part of it. Um, I think that's part of, you know, what you're, what you're um, looking at in your own research around, you know, the spectacularization and muckraking. Right? Yeah, thank you for that question. Just going to give a pause before I eagerly jump in. So again, you can use the chat or the Q&A. So I'm wondering if we might be able then to go back to this question of labor, which mm -hmm. I was going to either bother you with an email afterwards or mm -hmm. take use of my spectacular power as, as moderator. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, so you're noting that as a shift and I think that it's really crucial, like the, the kinds of you know, I, gosh, I just have to say to everyone to go read the book because I don't want to, you know, it's it's so recent and it, life has been so lifey that, of course, I can't presume everyone's read it yet. But you do this really beautiful work of setting up where the domestic and domestic violence comes from. And then you even just referenced it, right, where there's this this absolute power, despite a moment of emancipation and freedom to then, in fact, remove freedom and autonomy in the case of going into the home, right? You were talking about in, in what sounded like reconstruction and thereafter. Yeah. Um, so that those are moments where, you know, and you set up this question of the domestic as being both in the scene of enslaved labor and negotiation, the silent witness, but also in, so in the home, and not at once. And then now the college, I'm just thinking about the college campus and how it also does this work of collapsing, but also affirming boundaries around the family, work, living together, all mm -hmm. kinds of behavior that isn't only like, there's no other work environment that also has these yeah. kinds of, right? I mean, maybe there yeah. is, but nothing immediately comes to mind. Never say never. So yeah. thinking about yeah. how both this new enunciation of, of, of the workplace at the yeah. college campus and the target rape is, is Diane Rosenfeld's term, right? For, for, yeah. and this longer history, if you can take my, my sort of trajectory here, this genealogy and, and tell me where I'm going wrong or what yeah, might... yeah, you're not going wrong. It's just taking me back to the beginning of the book. Um, it's so beautiful. Yeah, where I, I, so I got really interested in this, this moment of, for me, this starts with the Constitution, and I got really interested in this moment where in Article 4, Section 4, um, the United States, uh, there, it's called the Guarantee Clause, and it's this moment in the Constitution where the president, uh, it, on, on, asking, uh, depending on the legislature also, has to guarantee that the United States is a republic. It's not a monarchy, it's not a dictatorship, it's, it's a republic. And interestingly, in that moment, the Supreme Court is not included, which could be an interesting you know, yes. third research project to think about, right? That it's the president and, and the legislature that are, that, are, that are supposed to guarantee the republic. And domestic violence, they're, in guaranteeing the Republic, they are to prevent domestic violence. And domestic violence is written as lowercase d, uppercase v. And I started thinking about that philological convention and, and put it into conversation with all of these court papers that I was seeing that have you know, uppercase d, uppercase v um, on them. It's a designation that tells you on a court document that it's a domestic violence case. And so I was really thinking, perhaps cybernetically, um, that those two forms, those two different ways of writing DV had something to do with each other. And I really, you know, opened the book um, with that argument. And at the time, um, I, I looked at the drafting history of, of that clause. 
and found that the southern states, um, for them, domestic violence was, you know, the social and economic catastrophe that would ensue were Black folks to become free, not autonomous, but free. Um, and so domestic violence, you know, right, you know, in that moment for me, meant something different than I had come, than I think we had come, have come to know. Um, and if we take that to the question of emancipation and reconstruction, um, Black women who were assaulted in their homes, they went to court immediately um, about that in addition to, um, you know, Black folks fighting for freedom very aggressively. Um, Kelly Carter Jackson is a, is a scholar who's written a beautiful, beautiful book called Force and, and Freedom. And she reiterates this, right, that a lot of times um, our understanding of, of Black history for some reason, give some odd suggestions that we that you know black folks were not aggressively, desperately fighting for freedom, right? And she and she's someone who has written an absolutely brilliant book about that. It's which my book very very stupidly doesn't cite, um, but I want to give her um, the props that she's due here on that question. Um, and so, these black women that were assaulted in their homes, they understand themselves to be emancipated people and they argue themselves as such in, in their court cases. And they offer deep um, explanations of exactly what happened. Fast forward that to now, we are you know, in a discourse of women overwhelmingly not wanting to go to court, overwhelmingly not wanting to be involved in any way such that um, the law, the Violence Against Women Act, is precisely that thing that kind of um, takes the discretion away from both the victim and police in addressing the issue. So it's not, you know, it's not just the victim who, um, who brings this kind of legal action forward. It's, it's the state that, that does so. Um, and so your question, though, makes me think about this another way in which a minor cybernetic hypothesis can emerge. And it is on this question, I think there were maybe a year or two ago, there was this debate um, on GitHub, this repository for computing that I don't know that much about, but in coding language, the term master and slave is used. And there is this moment during the pandemic where all these computing largely bros were debating about whether or not to change that terminology. Right. And it was hotly debated. Um, that terminology has changed. But interestingly, rather than using master and slave to describe certain function, functioning in, in code, parent child is now used, which is, a, I think, a great story to elaborate as a kind of minor cybernetic hypothesis to, to, to grab on to that um, discussion on GitHub, which largely was a discussion, I, I, I suspect, among men, and to turn that around into, you know, to contribute to a minor literature of the dispossessed and how talking about women and children and master and slave um, needs to be discussed in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing, brilliant. So that was, that that turn is another way back through, yeah, towards towards that, that very overlap, yeah. yeah. Your question about some, for some reason, your question about domestic violence, oh, it, it was the university space as yeah. being that space that really muddles what home is and what, your mom is right. I'm not oh, your mom. I'm your professor. That's not the same thing. The, and the work that we do together can't happen if you think I'm your mom. Right? Like, and yet, and yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not arrows of the classroom. It's transference of the classroom, indeed, and it's intense. Indeed. We have both time for one last question and one last question from the audience, from Tori, uh, who asked you if you might talk more about the difference between the silent witness as enslaved person and the silent witness as a technological device. Forensic silent witnesses like cameras gain their trustworthiness partially from being alleged, uh, the alleged inability to lie, 
but I would imagine enslaved people's testimony to not be given such credit. That's the question. And it wasn't. Um, <laughs> slaves could testify legally against each other. And of course they were made to, right? They, um, this wasn't like independent. It was, this wasn't autonomous people coming and testifying. It was, um, it was, you know, slaves who were forced into testimony only against themselves. Um, you would not have slaves testifying against uh, their masters. Um, and if you look at court documentation, the way that the slaves um, are referred to, not their own voices, but the way that they're referred to by um, you know, a, a white married couple that are, that are suing each other for divorce, um, they're listed as sort of, you know, Kara, a slave girl, you know, there's no, um, there's no biography, there's no real descriptor there. Um, so that's one of the ways in, the, in which they're different. However, I theoretically, I actually want to put the slave, the, the silent witness who is enslaved, who is an enslaved person and the technology together precisely around the question of fungibility. I think the silent witness who is enslaved becomes evidence yet again of how of, of, of fungibility being, you know, that key um, element of what it means to be a slave, um, you know, as it's, you know, very beautifully, brilliantly developed by Saidiya Hart and one of other scholars. Um, so for me, it's really about you know, but even when a silent witness is a, is a person, it'll, it allows me to think about the concept of fungibility. Well, we have to end there for today. I just wanna thank you again so much for coming to speak with the BCNM community, Professor Moore, and to all of you for joining. Come back for other events that are upcoming. Check out the website, it has amazing, endless, beautiful events coming up, both in this series and across others. And thank you so much again. Thank you so much for, you know, yeah. staying staying with that talk. <laughs> it was, it was uh, had some difficult moments, but thank you very much. And again, for the very, very kind um, invitation. And I really appreciate all of your questions. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you.